I'm Dom Nichols, and this is Ukraine The Latest. Today, we bring you the latest news from the battlefront, react to the Pope's call for Ukraine to negotiate with Russia, and talk about 20 days in Mariupol and its Oscar win. Bravery takes you through the most unimaginable hardships to finally reward you with victory. If we give President Zelensky the tools, the Ukrainians will finish the job. Slava Ukraini! Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday, we sit down with leading journalists from The Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's Monday, the 11th of March, two years and 16 days since the full-scale invasion began. Today, I'm joined by Brussels correspondent Joe Barnes and former tank commander and chemical weapons expert Hamish de Breton gordon I started with the latest military updates from Ukraine. Recently released geolocated footage shows Russia has continued to advance. Small scale, but as we've said before, all these advances do add up over time. So looking in Luhansk Oblast in the vicinity of Sinkivka, it's about 75 k's east of Kharkiv. Take a line from there down to kind of Bakhmut, really, and that whole line is moving west a few hundred metres over the weekend. From Bakhmut south down into Zaporizhia Oblast, there have been limited movements west by Russia, almost nothing really, in Zaporizhia Oblast itself and Hezon. So in, in Luhansk and to a certain degree Donetsk Oblast, Russia is still, still moving west, as we've been reporting recently. Now, separately to that, Russia appears to have sacked its top naval commander. This comes after the recent brilliant performance of the Black Sea Fleet. Our friend and colleague James Kilner has written about this. You'll find it uh, online. But basically, two Russian news sources, Izvestia, which is a Moscow-based newspaper linked to the Kremlin, and Fontarka, uh, St. Petersburg news agency, they're quoting unnamed sources as saying Admiral Nikolai Yevmenov, who's Russia's Navy, the Russian Navy's commander-in-chief since May 2019, has been fired and replaced by Admiral Alexander Moisev. Moisev, we are told, trained as a submariner under the Soviet Union, and in 1998 he was credited with firing the first commercial micro-satellites into space from the nuclear-powered submarine that he commanded. Right. Well done, Alexander. OK, as I say, James has got more on that on the website, but interesting that not only did Ukraine help them replace the, the commander of the Black Sea Fleet last year, but now the head of the Navy seems to have gone. OK, next one. An update from British MOD, British Ministry of Defence, over the weekend says Ukraine's almost certainly accelerated the construction of defensive positions on several areas of the front line, a subject we've spoken about regularly on this podcast. The, the defence intelligence message said that the work includes anti-tank dragon's teeth, so concrete structures like p- pyramid-type structures, if you like, that will th- prevent armoured vehicles from progressing, ditches, infantry trenches, minefields and fortified defensive positions all included as well. So this update was yesterday's MOD update. It says it's highly likely the expansion of defensive lines will reduce Russia's ability to advance or exploit tactical gains as part of its ongoing offensive that I've just been mentioning. MOD here in London say the establishment of major defensive positions is indicative of the attritional character of the conflict and means any attempt to conduct breaching operations, i.e. getting through defensive lines, any attempt to conduct breaching operations will highly likely be accompanied with high losses. So that that is what uh, Ukraine experienced last year in the counter-offensive. So they are attempting to achieve the same thing, preventing uh, Russia from continuing to advance west, putting in defensive lines, obstacle belts, all obstacle belts need to be covered by view and fire, obviously. There's no point. Oh, well, there's one thing just to slow the enemy down, but if you don't know anything about it, then then <laughs> what's the point? But also these defensive belts, these engineering tasks are there, are designed to sort of channel the enemy into a killing zone so you can then bring down pre-prepared fires onto them. So it's not just digging a hole and putting some people in it with anti-tank guns. There's a lot more to it than that. Hamish might have a view a little bit later on uh, what it might entail. Okay, the next one. President Zelensky has criticised Pope Francis's call, you may have seen this over the weekend, to negotiate with Russia, dismissing calls for Kyiv to have the courage to raise the white flag. He said it was virtual mediation from thousands of miles away. 
So in his evening address last night, President Zelensky thanked Ukrainian chaplains, adding, this is what the church is about, being with people, not two and a half thousand kilometres away, engaging in virtual mediation between those who want to live and those who want to kill them. You'll remember, for those that are not caught up with this, the Pope provoked anger over the weekend when he said Ukraine should negotiate with Russia. He said, when you see that you are defeated, that things are not working out, have the courage to negotiate. Obviously, a massively helpful comment. So Mr. Zelensky, uh, his words were echoed by Dmitry Kaleba, Ukraine's foreign minister. He posted on social media over the weekend, our flag is a yellow and blue one. This is the flag by which we live, die and prevail. We shall never raise any other flags, i.e. a white flag. Then Radzor Sikorski, Poland's foreign minister, he also offered some words. He said, how about for balance, encouraging Putin to have the courage to withdraw his army from Ukraine, which is a fair point. Now, the Kremlin obviously seized on this. They seized, they took the words and ran with them as a vindication of of the invasion. Maria Zakharova, spokeswoman for Russia's foreign ministry, she pops up every now and again, usually after Medvedev has been on the sherry, trying to calm things down. She said, the way I see it, the Pope is asking the West to put aside its ambitions and admit that it was wrong. Now, she used a lot of the same old arguments. I say same old, they may be for us, but of course the point is that we have been paying attention. The Kremlin are clearly aiming these tired old tropes at people around the world who haven't been, which is why, folks, I'm afraid it's our duty to keep talking to family, friends, colleagues, anyone who we hear still coming out with all this guff. Anyway, for the record, so we know what we're dealing with, Ms. Zakharova said the West was using Ukraine as an instrument of its ambitions to weaken Russia. As she said Russia has never blocked the negotiations and that the situation in Ukraine was at a dead end. So they are clearly aimed at people who are susceptible to these arguments, aided by the Pope. Now, separately, Mr. Slav Shenov, who's the Ukrainian director uh, of 20 Days in Mariupol, he won the country's first Academy Award last night at the Oscars. He said he would rather have no Oscar and no war waged in his country. He received the award for Best Documentary at the award last night. Or if you're in L.A. listening to this live, I suppose it's, what time is it now? Five in the morning, so you're probably just getting going on the after show party. But anyway, so Mr. Chernoff took the award. He said, oh, sorry, for the film showing the, uh, talk about the Russian siege in Mariupol, in which at least 8,000 people were killed. So the director, who's a video, video journalist for the Associated Press, shot the film during the first days of the full-scale invasion while, while trapped in the city with a team of journalists. He said, this is the first Oscar in Ukrainian history and I'm honoured. He said, but probably I will be the first director on this stage who will say, I wish I never made this film. I wish to be able to exchange this to Russia, never attacking Ukraine, never occupying our cities. But I cannot change history, cannot change the past. A couple more things. Uh, Russian occupation authorities have opened early voting in the presidential election. Um, they've opened voting in uh, in a number of areas in, in occupied uh, Ukraine. The uh, voting is on um, starts March the well started on March the tenth and last till March the fourteenth. There's some images on social media of some very happy soldiers posting votes in ballot boxes. And then finally, only because I think we need to balance the old light and shade, go and have a look at Google Maps. So we've talked about the Russian naval base at Oshimcheri in Georgia, the one of the areas of Georgia that Russian forces are basically um, inhabiting. Uh, go and have a look at their naval base that they've been building there. We think they're doing this because Crimea is increasingly becoming a no-go zone for the Black Sea Fleet. We know they've had to move back to uh, Novorossiya uh, in Russia, and now they're starting to try and build this naval base in Georgia. So you look at it this morning, and on Google Maps, if you look, if you zoom in, the naval base is listed as a public toilet, and it's clearly not a very good public toilet because whoever's done that and tagged it as such has only given it a one star review. So I don't know what you have to do to get five stars to be a, a Russian toilet worthy of five stars. But anyway, go and have a look, leave a review, see what you think. Now then, Joe, the muscles from Brussels. I've had a look at what we're going to chat about today, what you're going to chat about, and and it seems to be summarised with the words Orban, Macron, Canada, Japan, to the black hole rescue. Can you uh, tell us why on earth I've made those notes, please, because I can't remember. (laughs) Hi, Dom. Thanks, and good to be back, everyone. Um, Yeah, let's start with Victor Orban. 
who many know as the Hungarian Prime Minister, but he has been in Florida meeting Donald Trump at the former US President's Mar-a-Lago resort. And after that, Orban has since told Hungarian state television that Donald Trump, and I will quote, will not give a penny into the Ukraine-Russia war, end quote, if he is elected as president for a second term. You'll know that he is a shoe in Republican candidate ahead of basically November's election. November's election. So basically, Orban is, after these talks, is suggesting that Donald Trump will withdraw military support to Ukraine, which would effectively force Zelensky key to the negotiating table, bringing an end to the war. So we know Donald Trump has said numerous times, believe him or not, who knows what he what he actually means. That's what makes him so dangerous is he's unpredictable, that he would be able to end the war in 24 hours of coming to office. But from what Orban is saying, it looks like the plan in Donald Trump's mind is that to end the war is essentially by preventing Ukraine from having access to the means it needs to fight that war. So this is what Orban had to say. He went, it's obvious that Ukraine on its own cannot stand on its feet. So yeah, in sort of these slightly strange worlds we live in, um, where they pretend to be defending democracy and everything like that, they believe pulling the rug from the those fighting for their own democracy <laughs> is the best way of bringing an end to the conflict. Anyway, I guess to be expected, let's not read too much into it. A long way to go yet in the presidential race. And as I mentioned, nobody knows what Donald Trump might do. He might suddenly have an overnight epiphany and decide that he wants to send everything to Ukraine and help it win the war. Who knows? Then let's look at Emmanuel Macron, the guy who was once billed as being sort of Europe's friend of Putin, to then soft touch backer of Ukraine, to now the guy who's suggesting NATO boots should be on the ground in Ukraine helping out. It has emerged that he is believed to have been making a trip to Ukraine this week, but it has reportedly been delayed following a Russian missile attack on Odessa. That was last Wednesday, while President Volodymyr Zelensky was there meeting the Greek Prime Minister. So various accounts have this missile attack on Odessa on the port infrastructure of being within kilometres of the two world leaders or as little as 300 feet of the world leaders. And this is basically this attack from Russia is playing into the mind of Macron and his team as they plan their trip to Ukraine, according to sort of French media. So Macron had originally been planning to visit Kyiv in February. That was to discuss the French-Ukraine deal on long-term security assurances. But now that is looks like it's been put back to mid-March. So over the weekend, La Tribune de Manche, that's a French Sunday newspaper, reported that Macron's aides saw the attack which happened in the vicinity of Zelensky and the Greek Prime Minister, as a, and I quote, message, end quote, to Macron. The outlet reported that Macron now wants to expand his visit to include other NATO leaders. Rishi Sunak, the Prime Minister, is named as one of the potential leaders on that jaunt. So I guess the idea is safety in, safety in numbers. Does Macron feel like he has made himself a bigger target to the Russians, given that his recent rhetoric, as I mentioned, calling European and Western countries cowards for not supporting Ukraine. He's changed his wording to basically say we need to make sure Russia is defeated for the good of our own security. And as I mentioned, NATO boots on the ground. So that's a real ratcheting up of rhetoric from Macron. Actually, Macron has always been a sort of a constant target for Russian propagandists, much like Germany. The Kremlin believes it can sway Paris into being soft on its invasion. And actually, until the last year or so, since France probably donated storm shadows and other bits of kit, Paris has been softer than many other European capitals. So I think if we cast our mind back to mid-February, when Macron was originally due to visit Ukraine, the Kremlin circulated a fake video clip which appeared to look like a French television news segment and saying that Macron cancelled that trip because of a Ukrainian plot to assassinate him. So the former Russian president, Dmitry Medvedev, wrote on Twitter, X, whatever we call it, that the French president feared assassination in, quote, Nazi Kiev, end quote. So yeah, basically, the Kremlin see Paris as being easily swayed because Macron hasn't been as resolute as he has been recently on Ukraine. And that seems to be playing into the mind of Macron, who probably believes that he is a bigger target than is probably maybe justified, who knows? But also, are Russia really going to target a NATO leader? Who knows? I think the jury's still out on the missile strike in Odessa, whether it was actually targeted at the two leaders or whether it was just a happy coincidence or an unhappy coincidence. And I believe you have a question, Dom, so I'll stop there for a second. Yeah, I do, please, Joe, just before we move off this section. I mean, we were talking last week, I think I was hosting last week when the incident happened with the Greek 
uh, Prime Minister and, and President Zelensky. And I think I, I wasn't entirely sure how to think about it at the time, but I'm, I'm not convinced it was a targeted attack. As I said at the time, I think at the moment Putin would probably view the diplomatic and certainly the military field as going in the direction he would wish it, on the ground at least, if not in the air or the sea. So I, I didn't think that it would be a deliberate strike against the Greek Prime Minister because it would have answered all, raised all sorts of questions about is that Article 5 territory strike against NATO and so on. So I'm not sure that, that Mr Macron would cancel this visit or postpone it for that for those considerations, I think he's. I think he has made a sterner stuff than that. I don't think he would have cancelled just on the possibility. I think it's probably a diary snafu, which will be sorted out. But just on this, and I note the recent comments by Mr. Sikorsky, Poland's foreign minister, who's basically saying that what Macron has done is introduce strategic ambiguity. So Putin doesn't know actually what Europe's going to do now, partly because Europe doesn't know what it's going to do now. But there's a lot of ideas out there, including boots on the ground. And as we've said many times, this does not need to be a a psychological red line for us. There are NATO boots on the ground inside Ukraine. We've said it many times. There are US Marines at the embassy there. There is um, humanitarian and first aid training going on. We know of that. That's been that's out in the public domain. So we shouldn't allow ourselves to be boxed in as as if this is some kind of red line. But what, Joe, from your travels around Brussels, what is the view? Are people there happy that there's there seems to be increasing strategic ambiguity? People are talking about these ideas, getting past this fear that it just talking about them might be deemed provocative and escalatory. And actually, by having these ideas out in the open, not only do we talk about them, but also it just throws the calculus back to Putin and says, look, you don't know what we're going to do next. We are considering all these things up to and including boots on the ground. So you have no idea what's coming down the tracks. You are not going to set the narrative here. We are going to set the narrative and the momentum will be with us. What's your view on that? Um, I think there are many schools of thought, depending on who you speak to. If you would speak to the Germans, for instance, they would be, oh my God, no, no boots on the ground. Let's not do anything escalatory. And they deem that sort of language as escalatory and basically poking the hornet's nest of Vladimir Putin. And if you speak to the Poles, the Lithuanians and a few other sort of sort of Eastern, more hawkish countries, they appreciate the strategic ambiguity and they suggest, actually, why have we always shrouded ourselves in openness and telling uh, Putin and basically allowing it's, it's slightly odd. So let's let's use an example. We as the West let Ukraine know, obviously before this, but we let Russia know that Ukraine were going to have access to HIMARS and M270 multiple launch rocket launchers from the US, UK, France, uh, Germany have donated a few of them. And it took a while for Russia to adapt to that system. But imagine the situation if we hadn't actually told Russia that those systems were being sent to Ukraine, those capabilities. So, yeah, that's the question is, how do we go between it being escalatory or not by also giving Ukraine the best chance of seceding with the element of surprise? But, yeah, I think that's that. Let's stop and move on anyway. So there's been some early, and I say very, very, very early discussions on the potential of air travel to and from Ukraine resuming. So Ukrainian ministers have opened talks with American and European regulators on the possibility of resuming air travel between Ukraine and the rest of the world. Look, it's not going to be an immediate prospect. Those Ukrainian international airlines uh, into Borisport Airport in Kyiv um, are still very much within the range of Russian weapons. The skies over Ukraine remain to this day shut to any, every, anything that isn't a military aircraft and, well, Ukrainian military aircraft because they're shut to Russians and they get shot down if they're too close since February 24. But it's interesting, I think, because what we're looking at is the start of long term conversations about how does life look in Ukraine under the conditions of martial law? And I guess, does it offer a, and this is a personal assumption, does it offer a hint about what type of country the current Ukrainian government is planning to run as fighting is isolated away from the capital, Kyiv? So many of us who have flown in and out of Kyiv, sort of pre-full-scale invasion, I think I last took a flight, a Ukraine International Airlines flight from Brussels to Borisville. That happened while fighting was raging in the Donbass after the 2014 outbreak of war. So it is possible, but obviously baby steps. So Kyiv is looking to Israel as an example of how to manage an airport under the threat of missiles and rocket attacks. So if we then cast our mind back a bit, in February, Andrei Yermak, Zelensky's chief of staff, announced that work was underway 
to restore operations at one of the country's airports, basically after security concerns had been addressed. And there was actually footage of what appeared to be a commercial airliner taking off from a civilian airport. I believe it was Borisville Airport at the time. So it's unlikely that Kiev is the first destination for flights if it ever sort of, if they ever take off. I think we look at Lviv or other sort of smaller airports towards NATO's borders, which are further away from the fighting and further outside of Russian missile range. Anyway, let's come to Brussels where I am. The Swedish flag has officially been raised up its flagpole at NATO HQ to signify the Nordic nation's accession to the military alliance. We've reported extensively on Sweden joining, the ups and downs, the trials and tribulations, but look, it's really important news, so I'll cover it again briefly. I will steer away from offering too much detail on why it's taken almost two years to get Sweden in after Sweden and Finland applied to join, but we can basically blame Turkey and most recently Hungary for that. But Sweden does end two centuries of military neutrality to join NATO. That's a direct in a direct response to the Russian invasion of Ukraine and a demonstration of how Vladimir Putin has essentially failed in his goals of getting NATO to scale back on what he calls expansionist moves. You remember that was one of his sort of many justifications for invading Ukraine, like yada, yada, yada. So Sweden's accession is actually not only good news for Sweden, which then gets the umbrella of Article 5, that joint mutual defence clause. It also adds a lot, I think, to NATO. So Sweden has a top-notch military. Unlike many of its European allies, it actually spends over 2% of GDP on defence. That's the NATO target. We can look at systems capabilities like the Archer 155 millimeter self-propelled howitzer, the Gripen fighter jet, and various other systems that I'm sure Dom and Hamish would describe amongst best in class. But also then strategically, we take a bigger sort of helicopter view of what this looks like for NATO, Europe's defense. What we look with Sweden and Finland joining is a massive enlargement. I think it's over a thousand kilometers of border added between NATO and Russia now. That means Moscow is going to have to rethink where it places troops to defend its borders does that potentially drag troops from ukraine or other areas where they potentially could pose a risk to nato to cover sort of new vulnerabilities on that border even though look russia is not going to be attacked by nato because it's just not, not what it's about and then we look at the baltic sea which is another really important element it's a vital sort of oil trading route for russia and home to one of its nato uh, sorry one of its naval fleets but now the Black Sea is also basically entirely controlled by NATO countries. So some inside the alliance are now calling the Baltic Sea the NATO lake. And then one, one last update for me, Dom. Ukraine is looking to Canada and Japan to help fill the financial void it faces and a financial black hole that has essentially been worsened by the stalled US $60 billion aid package. So Kyiv has allocated around half of its annual 80 uh, annual $87 billion budget in 2024 to defence-related spending. But we have to remember that just above half, Ukraine only brings in $46 billion in domestic revenue each year. So it really has to look to its international partners to come in and basically plug the holes that are there from a non-military standpoint, even though a lot of it is military-based, which I'll go into now. So the EU has promised a four-year non-military aid package of 50 billion euros the first four 4.5 billion of that should arrive in kiev this week or next week but look that's not enough to sustain the spending as it goes and it basically raises massive questions over how do you pay to mobilize 500,000 new recruits as is muted in ukraine how are you going to pay for their salaries their pension their training everything from helmets body armor boots and stuff like that how are you going to fund that if you don't have this sort of cash available in your budget and so i think zelensky said when was it december to january i can't remember now when he gave his sort of big annual press conference he said it would take six taxpayers to fund one soldier so ukraine doesn't really have that without raising taxes massively so they have turned kiev has turned its mind to japan canada two g7 countries to basically ask for more non-military cash to support their budget but it also looks like Ukraine is then going to have to actually revisit its budget plans to slash non-military spending. So it's just really a glimpse of how often we cover the military side of donations. So what tanks, what kit, fighter jets, etc. But actually the financial lifelines that we also talk about are actually equally important now. And I will, I will stop there. Yeah, thanks, Joe. It's interesting. You, you say there about the Swedish flag going up to date at NATO headquarters Sweden and Finland just joining the alliance, 31 and 32 members, numbers 31 and 32, with Finland's 1300k border. I think that doubles the border that NATO has 
with Russia, but still only takes the border region to, it's either just below or just above 10%. So 10% of the Russian border touches a, a NATO member. So I mentioned earlier on how it's our duty to push back on all the, the rubbish narratives that are coming out of the Kremlin and Zakharova and et al. Well, there we go. So this idea that, that Putin says that NATO is surrounding Russia, it's just rubbish. But also this idea that NATO is an expansionist force. I mean, just anyone that comes up with that, just ask them, well, why did Finland and Sweden decide now, after decades of neutrality, to join? Or if you say, well, NATO forced them to, what's your evidence for that? Because there's plenty of evidence to show why they have requested to join. So what's the evidence on the counter argument for NATO making them join? And if you still have to keep going with the, the person you're speaking to on this, if they're saying that NATO poses a threat to Russia, why now with Finland joining? Why is Russia taking military personnel and equipment from that border that Russia shares with Finland to use in Ukraine? If there's this massive threat <laughs> that's just rocked up on the border with Russia from Finland. Now, why are they taking the, the, the kit away? I mean, now would be the perfect time for nasty old NATO to invade. Anyway, like I say, we, because we pay attention, these arguments just are borderline humorous. It's not humorous at all, of course, because of the stakes and the pain that people are enduring. But I look at these arguments and I'm just surprised that we have to keep running through them. But it only takes two or three steps of very clear, simple logic. No need to get flustered, no need to get outraged with the, the individual. Just ask two or three simple questions and they hit a brick wall. Anyway, Joe, thanks so much for that. Hamish, uh, keen keen on your ideas on the uh, the, the defensive fortifications that, that Ukraine is putting up and the effort that it takes to have a an effective defensive line. And then we've been chatting recently about the, the domestic pressure here in the UK on, on the defence spending issue. I know you've got some thoughts on that. And then, of course, we'll have a little bit of uh, tankathon. But Hamish, welcome back to the pod. Yeah. Hi, guys. Dom, Joe, g- good to be with you. I think very interesting on the defensive lines that, that Ukraine's now putting up. I suppose a lot of people say, why are they waiting now when the Russians have been pushing hard around Abdika or Bakhmut for a long time now? And I, I think it's down to one of the key things you said there, Dom. This is a massive engineering task over a huge area uh, and the depth of it. I've spoken recently about the challenges we had 33 years ago getting through the Iraqi defensive lines in Kuwait to kick them out of Kuwait after they're legally invaded. But they were nothing considered to what the Sorovkin line is, what the Russians built with trenches, dragon's teeth uh, and the minefield. So it is uh, an acknowledgement that the Russian forces are making ground in certain areas. And of course, it's a trade-off really between manpower and tank power, as it were like, and using physical defences, because you can't cover every single bit of ground with troops and tanks. But if you can, uh, as you were talking about earlier, channel people into areas, to killing areas, then, then you can use your forces more effectively. So yeah, it's sad in a way, because I think a lot of us hope that wouldn't be required. But I think it, it's probably part of the overall plan. And we, I, I think there's a piece today coming out that, that the Ukrainians are looking at a big campaign in Crimea and they're shaping operations, that defeating the Black Sea Fleet and attacks into Crimea are very much part of that. But if they're going to have a successful strike into Crimea, they need these hard shoulders, these hard defences to work off. So, yeah, let, let's hope it's part of that. But a, a huge engineering effort. And I, I just like to yeah talk a little bit about the defence spending and the budget. I, know, I don't want to cover the ground you covered last week, but I wrote a piece for Forces News, which is part of the British Forces Broadcasting Service, which is the media organization that keeps you know our troops informed of what's going on in the world I, I would say although the government pays for it as far as i'm aware the mod doesn't have an editorial c- control and just because i write for it doesn't mean to say that necessarily the mod agrees but uh, tom tugan security minister came out today oh no yesterday i think saying that we need to spend more on defense two and a half percent And of course, other Telegraph contributor, Ben Wallace and former defence minister, has said two and a half is the minimum. We need more like three. And the title of my piece, 
for forces news is get defence wrong and tax cuts are, are irrelevant. I also, it, it's sort of background of the threats. Uh, interesting German head of security over the weekend saying Germany needs to get real about the threats coming from the east. And I think in a way, so do we in this country. The fact that defence is not an election issue for anybody is staggering when we look at what's happening in Europe, when we look at some of our allies being the Germans last week suggesting British boots on the ground. And again, I'm not going to cover that. Uh, And we all know the potential for a a Trump administration from the end of the elected the end of this year, starting the beginning of next, which will create further uncertainty. And what I'm suggesting is our conventional defence at the moment a deterrent and that's what defence should be. Interesting enough as well, uh, and again, I think it was up on the website, the Pentagon suggesting that they thought we were very close to a nuclear attack back in 22 from the Russians when Ukraine were, 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 was pushing toward Kherson. Again, that is part of this tapestry. And I don't want to sound cynical, but when we look at the defence that Britain has now and It's born out of the strategic defence review that was done before Russia was a real threat. In my mind, it's been rather crazy, some very clever academics, wily politicians and perhaps civil servants to create a force that brilliant in space and cyber and maritime. But perhaps, you know, now that we see how war has been fought in Ukraine, whether actually having aircraft carriers that can project power in the Far East is great. But in my mind, that's not our biggest threat at the moment. It's having a conventional force that will project power um, in Europe. So I think that is what we're looking at. And so we're we're spending 2% at the moment on defence. And we see what that gets us. We see what 30 plus percent the Russians are spending, but what gets them. So I I think it's all about, are we in the, despite everything else happening at the moment, If we uh, and we have Macron talking about boots on the ground, maybe a bit for for his domestic audience. I mean, he does seem to sway in the breeze of French public opinion on these sort of matters. But it's something a lot of Western countries discarded that comment as soon as Macron made it, which to me is handing the potential advantage back to Putin. So I think it's something that should not be dismissed. I expect it's boots in the air or whatever the correct term is what the Ukraine really needs because as we discussed before to enable effective land armoured operations on the ground it's all about air superiority it's all about air power and again harping back to my Gulf War one days that's what we had where which gave us that freedom of manoeuvre so really in sum on this piece before going to talk about the real hard business of tank warfare that we've learned a lot more about recently, particularly Challenger 2. It's when we can only put one armoured brigade into the field and we only have one echelon in simple terms, we have one hit. Once that armoured brigade is gone, there's not really anything to follow on. And that is probably something that is too light. So I think we, in my personal belief. Maybe we need a new uh, strategic defence review to make sure that we're properly configured. But 2% spending on defence when the threats are that they are at the moment is too light. I'll I'll stop there before on tanks. Uh, Dom, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Hamish. I just wanted to pick up on one of your points and expand another, if I may. We're talking about the defence spending here in the UK. We are just over 2% of GDP spent on the Ministry of Defence. And you said, you, you quoted, or you said 30% in, in Russia. I just want to be clear, that's 30% of government spending is on defence, but it equates to about 6 or 7% of Russia's GDP. Because I've heard this figure around and it's very, it's very scary and, and doesn't look right. And I think that's because it is not right. Russia is not spending, when we talk about Britain spending 2%, we don't. It's not right to say Russia is spending thirty percent. Russia is spending about six or seven percent of its GDP. It's just a, a much higher proportion of its government spending is going on defence. So I just wanted to uh, uh, try and get that correct. And then, secondly, the only other thing I'll mention was you said that a couple of ministers over the weekend. It was Friday night, actually, that this rather extraordinary intervention. Tom Tugendhat, who is our current serving security minister, and Anne Marie Trevelyan, who is a foreign office minister at the moment. She's a, been a, a, um, a minister in the Ministry of Defence some years ago, but they put out this 
comment piece basically on Anne Marie Trevelyan's LinkedIn page. Remember that LinkedIn? So she put that out there or they put it out there calling for two and a half percent. And it was an extraordinary intervention because it didn't get cleared by number 10. So all ministerial pronouncements and sort of comments and op-eds and all that kind of George every time we speak to them it's all going to be cleared by number 10 that didn't happen here and so we thought there's going to be a massive cabinet spat and all that kind of George number 10 said that actually when it comes to social media uh, ministers can do what they like which is rather rather amusing and we look for more ministers to opine on the defense budget on social media because they don't need the authority of number 10 who knows what's happening behind closed doors today I'm sure Tom Tugendhat and Amory Trevelyan's phones are buzzing even as we speak from number 10. But anyway, that's where it was. So you can go and find it. I wrote about it yesterday for Le Telegraph Dimanche and it's online today. You'll see the, all the, the quotes that they said. But yes, it's pushing this debate on that two and a half percent should be the floor and the aspiration should be higher than that. If the Well, that's the numbers. Those are the numbers that equate to the arguments and the world they describe in prose. So if you're serious about the pros, they need to get serious about the numbers. Anyway, Hamish, back to you. There's an interesting thing from our friend and colleague, Jerome Starkey in The Sun. He's been jumping in and out of Challenger 2 in Ukraine on a training range, nowhere near. I don't think, I'm not saying anything about Jerome, but I don't think Challenger 2 is, is being used in operations at the moment. But Jerome, lucky fellow, has been in and out of Challenger 2. That's in The Sun. And uh, you had some thoughts about the comments they were making, particularly about the gun, Hamish. Yeah, Tom, absolutely. And I, I was actually with Jerome last week. He and I and Lord Dannett and um, Chip Chapman were making a, a film about state of the British defence. But Jerome had a long chat with him about his Challenge 2 piece. Um, so I thought it'd be worth um, making a few comments because I think they were very interesting and linked to some other pieces. People might have seen also there was a male... Uh, Daily Mail video posted over the weekend that I did retweet, um, basically saying Ukraine Armoured uh, Corps thought that Challenge 2 was the best tank and was absolutely brilliant. Jerome pouring a little bit, slight bit of cold water on it. But I think what, what was really interesting, and also when one considers that Britain's new tank, Next Generation, called imaginatively the Challenger 3, looks rather similar to the Challenger 2. My sort of thoughts are really, I really hope, and I'm sure people are looking at what's happening in Ukraine very closely. Because one of the key things that, that Jerome was saying was that actually the 120 millimeter rifle gun, the Ukrainians thought was absolutely brilliant because it's accuracy over such a long distance, 2.53 Ks. And in Challenger 2, they get Challenger 3 rather, they're getting get rid of it which I understand why, because they want to go to the, the NATO standard smoothbore, 120 millimetres, so we can all share ammunition. But actually, it, it seems to have a quality all of its own. The other thing, we know the Challenger 2 armour is great, but there was quite a lot of criticism about its manoeuvrability and reliability. And I just, when it comes to manoeuvrability and it getting stuck, you know, picture of it stuck in a bog. Well, Dom, you and I both know you, you drive a tank into a bog and it's going to get bogged down. doesn't matter you know, unless it's a hovercraft tank, which is an idea for my next book. It's just going to get bogged down. But what the Challenger 2 does suffer from, as its predecessor Challenger 1, is its power-to-rate ratio. In other words, how powerful is its engine compared to the weight? Challey 2, 70-odd tonnes, it's got a 1,200 horsepower used to be a, a Rolls-Royce V12. It's actually a, now a Perkins V12. That is not, it hasn't quite got the guts. And I'm rather concerned that, again, Chally 3, they're talking about the same engine, a bit uprated. I think most people would actually say, put the MTU, the Leopard 2 engine in there, 1,500 horsepower, poke that up a bit more and then you, you've got the ability to get this beast moving around so i think that's slightly unfair and everybody who's been a tank commander has been bogged a lot of it is experience knowing looking at the ground knowing where to go and all the rest of it, it also a lot of talk about its unreliability or i think what jerome's saying it's a lack of spares now I have spent a long time in my career on Challenger 2. And in fact, my last memory is doing the pre-second Gulf War training in Canada. I was second in command of two RTR. 
my tank covered to over two and a half thousand miles without a single breakdown or problem. So the unreliable, I don't get. It's like anything mechanical, bit a tank, a helicopter, whatever, properly maintained, it'll keep going. And and with the spares, if there is a problem with spares, I hope the MOD are listening and and get that sorted out. The the final bit of this, as you say, Dom, we're not entirely sure whether Chali 2 has actually been in the van of the battle yet. Hopefully, that is what's been prepared for the great Crimea operation. But I have been hearing that tanks have been used in isolated events, individual events, particularly around Abdifa and Bakhmur, where they've been used as long-range snipers. That's fine, but but also used to attack trenches. Uh, and as we've discussed many times, that, that has never worked. We worked that out in the First World War. Actually, it wasn't until Combray, uh, 20th of November 1917, where tanks were working with infantry and artillery and air that, that made real progress. So that something else that I'm hearing is actually that Ukraine soldiers are absolutely brilliant, men and women, the bravest around. But when it comes to combined arms operations, particularly at the higher level brigade, perhaps that is Ma- Macron talking about his boots on the ground. Maybe he should be getting his experts in brigade and divisional warfare on the ground to l- lend support. So that's a slight worry. But going back to the foot, my first topic on, on, on the budget and everything else, I think it's the whole armoured land warfare that we're seeing in Ukraine is, is absolute currency to holding the Russians and defeating them. And if there are gaps in it, let's hope that the Allies provide everything that's needed to to be able to do that. But yeah, I think Challenger 2, Leopard 2 and and Abrams are performing exceptionally well, but there are always issues. You can't drive a tank through a bog, never have been able to, never will. But let's see how this, this develops. Yeah, thanks, Hamish. You're right. You can't drive a tank through a bog. I seem to remember buying many, many yellow handbags back in the day, which I'm sure some will remember. Yellow handbag was the term given for, I think, was it a 12-pack or an 8-pack? Herford of pills, lager in a kind of cardboard box that you'd have to go and buy and ask the reams to come and drag you out of the bog and you just lob your tank into it. Yeah, so I bought a few yellow handbags in my time. I'm going to start drawing it to a... I'm not going to ask you, Hamish, how many how many you've bought. You've probably bought a supermarket's worth, but anyway, there we go. Coming up, we hear final thoughts from Joe Barnes and Hamish de Breton gordon My final thought, I would just direct people to have a look at Critic Mag, either online or you can see it on social media. You'll see a good article there from Patrick Porter from the University of Birmingham Strategic Studies. He's talking about soft power. It's very interesting, where, particularly in the British context, although it's applicable to everybody, when we talk about, as we've had this demonstration of actually what is power in the 21st century and hard power, um, Britain loves to go on about we're a soft power nation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, how much soft power is being used right now. And as Patrick says, if soft power doesn't deter, it doesn't change behaviour, what's it for? Anyway, an interesting little tour around all things soft power, I thought, in Critic Mag. But coming to final thoughts, Hamish in a moment, but uh, Joe, come to you for final thoughts, please. And before, or maybe morphed into one, I think you, you've got some thoughts on the defences, the, these defences that, that Ukraine is building now. Maybe start with that and go into final thought, please. How about I do one better and I'll make it my final thought. So, yeah, it's interesting to see Ukraine is now actively building defences towards the sort of the genuine front lines. But does that have a speak more about what Ukraine's intentions are? So you two chaps would be a lot better versed on the actual tactics and why you would do this. But essentially... Going static on their lines signifies they might not want to, by really fortifying, is might signify they might not want to move at all, which from Ukraine's uh, political standpoint, their their leadership has said the their war aim is to expel Russia back to the 91 borders, including Crimea. So if you suddenly start building static defences, that hampers that. And then you also, I think we'd look back, I've spoken to many experts on this, and they would always say the same thing. One of the main principles of defence is actually offensive actions. So actually, is that sort of issue? Is that, does that become an issue if they are digging in and 
then unable to be flexible with their line of defense. But then also the idea of a static defense is not going to be great. I've not spent a lot, a great deal of time in sort of trenches in the cold weather and stuff like that. But these Ukrainian soldiers are doing exactly that. So that means if they're really dug in, they're sat in fortifications, their skills and their fitness are definitely going to only degrade over time as that sort of if they are the longer they are sat in trenches. So it's just it's interesting to see that potentially Ukraine has moved away from its or maybe changing its war aims slightly as it seeks to dig in. Or maybe it's just simply making a point to its international partners, mainly the US, saying that, look, we can't win this war without you. So please come and help us. But yeah, that's for me, folks. Thank you. I will just jump in there if I may, Joe. We spoke about this a little bit, I think, last week. I, I, my opinion is that, that building firm, very firm defensive lines does not mean you have no further offensive intent. It is the strong base, the springboard from which you throw the punch at the enemy. So there is a mindset, it's a bit of an old Soviet mindset, I think, that says once you start digging, you've given up the momentum and, you, and you're in your own mind, you're transitioning to the defensive. I don't think that's the case. That's certainly not the case with Western doctrine. So I don't see anything wrong with what they're doing. I think possibly part of the reason for the delay in Ukraine digging the equivalent of the Sorovkin line, if you like, I want to call it that, is because there is still partly this culture of, oh, oh, right, okay, lads, so, you, so you're not going forward anymore, you're just going to hold what you got, which is not the case at all. And when you build a firm defensive position and you put your minefields out in front of you and you've got your stat plan, your surveillance target acquisition plan, I don't know why it's got, it should be stat plan or just your stat. Anyway, you've got your, you've got your surveillance plan plan in front of you you know what you're looking at you know you can bring fire down you know also where the safe lanes are for you to be able to go through and continue the offensive or you know how to make some certain lanes safe such that you're not just putting a load of mines in front of you and then going oh bugger i hadn't thought about that what how are we going to go forwards so it's a coherent and coordinated and professional defense is a is the first precursor to an offense and you know how to get past your own defensive lines without causing yourself too much mischief in order to get stuck into the enemy. So a slightly different view there. But anyway, that was me jumping in. Apologies for that. Hamish, a final thought, please. Yeah, Tom, I I concur with you. Absolutely. I I mentioned about hard shoulders, deception, everything else. So I wouldn't go too static on it. I think it's part of the piece and we'll, we'll look at it very very carefully over the next few weeks and months. But yeah, my, my final thought, Putin's election in inverted commas coming up at the end of the week, if anybody's uncertain about him, he's going to win 90% of the vote, presumably, or maybe a bit more. That is not a democracy. And I think it's unwittingly Macron and the Pope have been pretty unhelpful over the last couple of weeks. And I hope these great people just have a little think before they fire off and whether actually by what they're doing is not aiding and betting this tyrant who's, who's about to win a landslide victory in his country. So, yeah, let's see what happens at the weekend with Putin. Unfortunately, hopefully the ghost of Navalny will be around. I know that Mr Navalny is calling for people to silent protest. Let's hope they do that as they came out at Navalny's funeral. Um, but, yeah foregone conclusion but let's hope these static defenses are actually a precursor for better times in future ukraine the latest is an original podcast from the telegraph to support our work and to stay on top of all our ukraine news analysis and dispatches from the ground please subscribe to the telegraph you can get your first three months for just one pound at www.telegraph.co.uk forward slash ukraine the latest Or sign up to Dispatches, our foreign affairs newsletter, bringing stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a Ukraine Live blog on our website, where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day, including insights from regular contributors to this podcast. We also do the same for other breaking international stories. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm London time, each weekday on Twitter Spaces, follow The Telegraph on Twitter so you don't miss it. To our listeners on YouTube, please note that due to issues beyond our control, there is sometimes a delay between broadcast and upload, so if you want to hear Ukraine the latest as soon as it is released, do refer to podcast apps. If you appreciated this podcast, please consider following Ukraine the latest on your preferred podcast app and leave us a review as it helps others find the show. Please also share it with those who may not be aware we exist. 
As the disinformation war ramps up, we are relying on your support more than ever. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing ukrainepod at telegraph.co.uk. We do continue to read every message. You can also contact us directly on X, formerly Twitter. You can find our handles in the description for the episode. As ever, we are especially interested to hear where you are listening from around the world. Ukraine The Latest was today produced by Giles Gear, Rachel Porter and Georgia Cohn. Executive producers are David Knowles and Louisa Wells. 